Now, one of the things that one of the things that baffles us, at least it baffles me, is when uh, otherwise very intelligent people do unintelligent things. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, Paul Frampton was a professor of theoretical physics at the University of North Carolina and renowned in his field, and yet he was convinced by an online bikini model to try to smuggle two kilograms of cocaine into Argentina. He was caught, arrested, and jailed. And then in 2003, Steve Jobs was diagnosed with a treatable form of pancreatic cancer, and yet despite his doctor's recommendations for medical intervention, he decided for nine months to use alternative medicine instead, a decision he regretted later, and a decision which some medical people believe uh, contributed to or hastened his death. They even have a term for something called Nobel disease. It's also called nobelitis. And it refers to people who have won Nobel prizes and yet hold to some beliefs or opinions that aren't really sound. So for example, in 1993, Kerry Mullis won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry and yet uh, later in a autobiography, he professed to believe in astrology and claims to have met a radioactive talking raccoon who he believed was an extraterrestrial alien. I don't want to sound judgmental, but it sounds like he went too deep into Guardians of the Galaxy. That's what it sounds like to me. Now, the thing of it is, why does this happen? Well, uh, there's people that have looked into this, and there's a, a, a Another intelligent person by the name of Andre Spicer who uh, wrote an article about this, which you can find online, and he says there's a couple of things in play here. First of all, there's more than one type of intelligence. And IQ tests, which we often use as the gold standard for measuring intelligence, actually only measures analytical intelligence. And then for the first 20 years of our lives, as we go through uh, the school system, no matter what country we are in, those that have high levels of analytical intelligence are praised and uh, rewarded uh, for having that. But there's other kinds of intelligence, like creative intelligence and practical intelligence, and those are very important in life in the real world. And so you could have very high analytical intelligence, but if you're low on practical or creative intelligence, you might find it tough uh, making your way in the world. But the other reason, and perhaps the most important reason why this kind of thing tends to happen is that very intelligent people tend to take mental shortcuts. And they think that they can get away with them because they think that they are above average in their intelligence. And they may have an IQ test score to back them up on that. And then what happens is they're not open to learning from other people. Now, here's the thing. I would venture to say most of us, if not all of us, do exactly the same thing. So you could, you could take a group of people and you could ask them about any one thing that people generally do. Like, let's say driving. I'm not going to do this. I don't want to embarrass anybody. But if you took a bunch of people and you said, who here thinks that they are an above average driver? Probably 80% of the people would put their hand up. Which, if you think about it, does not make any sense. Because average means that Probably half are above average, but half are below average. And so we're all kind of falling into this predicament about intelligence. And so what's a way out? Well, a way out is wisdom. Because wisdom is not just knowing things, knowing information. Wisdom is knowing how to properly use information. 
And there's a big difference. But then that just leads to another question. How do we grow in wisdom? So that's the question that we're going to be thinking about today. And to guide us as we do that, we're going to be digging into Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 to 18. If you have a Bible or a Bible app, I invite you to turn there now, but the, the verses will also be on the screen. Now, here's a bit of uh, background uh, to the book of Proverbs. It's in the genre of wisdom literature. And so the idea is, uh, it's, wisdom literature is about giving practical advice uh, to help people function in the world. And uh, it has these uh, short uh, two-line statements uh, throughout the book of Proverbs that are often written in very colorful language and uh, sometimes use opposites that they compare and contrast. But uh, it's all a vehicle to help people grow in wisdom. And sometimes what will happen in the book as you go through it is you'll find that wisdom and folly or foolishness are personified as women. And the reason for that is both of those nouns are in the feminine form in Hebrew. And then what the book does is it makes a case for choosing wisdom over uh, folly. Now, the book of Proverbs has a unique insight, and uh, that is that you need to start with relationship and faith if you want to grow in wisdom. And we see that early on in the book of Proverbs, where it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so you can see that aspect of faith there, but you can also see that aspect of relationship. And this is because our wisdom is always transferred through relationship from one person to another. It could be through teaching. It could through, be through mentoring, uh, which is something that we value here at Walnut Grove Lutheran Church. Uh, it could be a familial relationship. Um, but it always happens through relationship. And growing in wisdom, though you may not have thought about this, requires us to have faith or trust. First of all, we need to have trust in that source of wisdom that we're looking to, that it actually has wisdom for us. And second, we need to have trust that the source of wisdom that we're looking to has our best intentions in, at heart, wants the best for us. And then third, we need to trust that the wisdom that that source gives us will actually be a benefit or blessing to us. And so this issue of trust is a very important one. And the book of Proverbs is divided into several sections. The section that we're looking at today is uh, from the front part of the book, the prologue. And it's um, uh, written as a father talking to his son. Now, much of the book of Proverbs was uh, written by Solomon. Uh, some of it was edited and uh, compiled later on. And some of it is from other sources. But so this is the way this one particular section is written. A father is talking to his son. And as he does that, we see that there are stages to growing in wisdom. So it starts off this way. Listen to my instruction. Uh, verse, chapter 1, verse 8. Listen, to my, listen, my son, to your father's instruction. And do not forsake your mother's teaching. Stage one. Stage two. Accept my words. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So listen, accept, and then keep my commands. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. Now, Notice a few things here. This word keep has this sense in Hebrew of guarding or keeping safe, watching over, just like you would guard a treasure. 
And so uh, th- it, as this father is talking to his son, this third stage of growing a wisdom is to treasure the commands that are given in our heart, in the center of our being. Now, we tend to think of the heart as a, our emotional center, uh, but the uh, ancient Hebrews saw the heart as the, not only the center of the being, but the center of our will. And so what this passage is saying is, treasure the commands that I give you and keep them in the center of your being, hold them close and live by them as you make decisions throughout life. And if you haven't caught it already, of course, this kind of way of talking father to a son, we can imagine it as God our father talking to us, his children. So, and throughout the book of uh, Proverbs, and we see it again here, it gives us the benefits of treasuring wisdom. For they will prolong your, so these are the commands of the Father, they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. And so we see here, there's the prolonging of life, And there is peace, shalom peace, so that's wholeness and healing in all aspects of life, but also a joy of life. And then prosperity, that sense of doing well in life. Now, keep in mind in the book of Proverbs that a lot of the benefits that he talk about are kind of general things. Like if you follow the wisdom God gives us, generally speaking, these good things are going to happen. But they're not promises from God. They're not promises in the sense that if you confess your sins, I will forgive you. They're not promises in the sense if you believe in Jesus, I will give you eternal life. They're kind of general things that hold true most of the time. Sometimes good people do suffer. Sometimes good people have a bad thing happen to them and they're impoverished. It does happen. Now, then the father does something that's kind of interesting in He gives us the key, what I think is the key to growing in wisdom. In the verses that follow, he says, let love, which is kesed, and we've talked about this word before, that sense of loyal, loving kindness, that mercy and graciousness and compassion. So let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so this sounds a lot like that earlier statement. Though instead of talking about the Father's commands, it's talking about love and faithfulness. But in both cases, the Father is asking the Son to hold them close in his heart. And so what's going on here? There seems to be some kind of parallelism or equivalency. And so it's like... Uh, also a benefit, but we'll get to that maybe later. It's like saying the Father's teaching and commands are equivalent to the Father's chesed, loyal, loving kindness, and faithfulness. So what does this mean? I think what it means is this, that God's teaching and commands are what loyal, loving kindness and faithfulness look like. And it's God's loyal, loving kindness and faithfulness to us that enables us to listen to, accept, and treasure his teaching and commands. And so another way we could say this, uh, you might have heard this in a different way, but this is uh, something that I think is important for us as God's people to think about, and that is people won't care what God knows until they know that God cares. And as his people, we're the ones that are going to reflect that love and care into the world around us. So if people don't see God's love in us, why would they be drawn to the God that we worship? 
Now, there's an importance of uh, relationship and faith, not only in growing in wisdom, but also in using or exercising wisdom. So what does wisdom look like? Well, uh, we read in Proverbs, and it tells us, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. And so this verse is talking about trust in the sense of leaning with all our weight on God. And it's talking about a transfer of trust from ourselves, which is kind of our default position, to trusting fully in the Lord. So that's one part of it. But then uh, the author of this particular passage kind of goes, you know, to the heart of the matter and those things where we... Uh, maybe need God's wisdom the most, but perhaps struggle the most as well. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. And so from a worldly sense, it doesn't make any uh, sense at all to take a portion of our income, let's say 10%, and give it away to our church or work that God's doing in other areas. But God's saying this is wisdom. It's a recognition that God owns it all. He owns everything we have. He owns us. And so by giving that portion uh, to him, we're honoring him. We're recognizing uh, his ownership over us and over all things. And then third... My son, do not discipline, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. And so this comes to the issue of suffering. And so the wisdom God is encouraging us to have is when we suffer, to see it as an opportunity to grow closer to God. I'm not saying that's easy, but I'm saying that even when we suffer, God has something good for us. If we have eyes to see it. So what is the value of wisdom? So wisdom has infinite value in and of itself. Uh, Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. So, dear friends, if you don't already know this, I'm going to tell you that you have one and only one life to live. And the reason that wisdom is so precious is because it will help you to live your one and only life in such a way that you will make a difference not only in the here and now, but forever with God. So wisdom is valuable for that reason, but wisdom is also valuable because of the blessings that it can give us. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. And so when we follow the Lord's wisdom, we tend to have, not always, but we tend to have a more peaceful and enjoyable life. Because what he wants to do is steer us away from things that can lead us away from him. But wisdom is also valuable because it connects us to the tree of life. She, that is wisdom, is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. So we saw the tree of life in, or we see the tree of life in Genesis in the early part. And then God's people were cut off from the tree of life because it would not be good for them to live forever and be broken by sin in that state. But then the tree of life shows up at the end of the Bible in Revelation. And human beings will once again have access to it. 
And that's because of a tree of life in the middle of history, which is the cross of Jesus Christ. So this leads us to our most important point, and that is that Jesus is the wisdom of God. And he's the reason that we can trust in God with all of our heart. And we see that in Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ crucified the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. So without knowing our need for salvation, we will never see the wisdom of God in sending Jesus into the world. So it takes a posture of humility for us to see what God is offering to us. And some very intelligent people have said that it's foolishness to believe in the cross of Jesus Christ. That it's foolish to believe, first of all, in God. Second, that it's foolish to believe that God would come into this world and become fully human. It's foolish to believe that a divine being would willingly go to the cross and suffer the shame and the, the, just the agony of being there. And it's also foolishness that a human being would ever rise from the dead. And it's only because uh, we have seen the loyal love and kindness and the faithfulness of God that we can listen to, accept, and treasure that wonderful gift of what Jesus has done for us. You see, with the, the, the most wise thing we human beings can do is to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So God's wisdom is his loyal, loving kindness and faithfulness. It was God's loyal, loving kindness that prompted him to not destroy all of creation when our first parents disobeyed God and all of creation was corrupted by sin. It was God's wisdom that moved him to promise humanity that he would send a Messiah who would save us from our sins. It was wisdom that prompted Jesus Christ to come into this world and become one of us and pay the full cost of our forgiveness by going to the cross and dying for us there. And it was the Father's wisdom that raised Jesus from the Christ to begin a new creation. One, in, one that is centered on Jesus Christ and supported by Jesus Christ. A, one in which all things, even those times of suffering which we may experience, work together for our good. And one in which, at the end of time, all things will be made new, including us. So the challenge that I wish to leave with you today is not from me. It's actually from God's word. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your wisdom, and how we can be connected to your wisdom through faith in you. Thank you for your loyal, loving kindness and faithfulness in continually being merciful and compassion, compassionate towards us and in sending Jesus to be our Savior. And we thank you, Jesus, for your wisdom and giving us life in your name. 
And so bless us, Lord, and help us to be a blessing. Help us to reflect your love into the lives of the people around us so that they may know you and how much you love them. In your holy and precious name we ask this, and all God's people said, Amen.